Can I please unsubscribe from Snow? Why is a sense of place important to folklore? Uh, how do you cause a problem for things like birds? Why is seemingly pointless flavor important to world building? I'm Carrie. Uh, I'm Josh. And I'm Monica. And this is the World Builders Podcast. I'm Carrie. I'm Josh. And I'm Monica. And this is the World Builders Podcast, because you can't build a planet without a plan. In this podcast, we, your hosts, explore settings in genre fiction by crafting them here and now for you, our listeners. We have explored Xanthuru through its history, different cultures, the magic system. We've gone through player-created content and NPCs for this campaign setting this season. We have made it to the end of this season for the World Builders podcast, spoiler warning. I know, you're all heartbroken. I understand, I'm heartbroken too. Uh, We are never done exploring Xanthuru, though, because uh, really we just wanted to give you that that taste, the appetizer, the sampler platter, if you will. Get your, you know, your breadsticks, a couple mozzarella sticks and marinara, maybe a couple of fried mushrooms, chicken wing or two, you know, what have you. Uh, in the attempts of giving you a good overview of the world and piquing your curiosity enough to stay tuned for our future adventures there. Because don't forget, we are debuting a live play Open Legend campaign very soon in this world. And we hope that you will join us for that because, hey, now you know about the world. Let's see what kind of stories we can tell there. I'm so excited and I just can't hide it. Yeah, but we do have some sort of like, this is our sort of miscellaneous episode where we have a bunch of different topics that we want to talk about um, and sort of wrap up those last minute sort of questions we've gotten about it. Not that we can't answer these questions in future seasons, but uh, these are more specific to Xanthuru. So given that this is the, uh, the, the salad of the meal, you know, the promissory note of food slash content uh consider this the uh the croutons and the bacon bits and other such things that you put on top of your salad guys i'm hungry now sorry i just ate lunch and i'm hungry again yeah because you have all these broad strokes when you're building a world right you've got your places you've got your people you've got your history your magic if it's a magic setting but those are just the beginning a lot of the things that really make a world feel alive are the little touches And so we're going to go over that right now, starting with a topic that we've been having a crap ton of fun with on our Discord, actually, which you can find a link to at rhinobot.net if you would like to join us there. We talked before about, we mentioned very briefly the existence of this zodiac that kind of governs the seasons and the calendar in Xanthuru, mainly what we talked about being the sign and the month of the serpent where everything is dead, nothing heals, nothing grows, etc. But there's 12 other months. So what are those other months? What are those signs? What are the qualities associated with them? Because every zodiac has qualities associated with people who are born under that sign. And we've been playing around with this a little bit on the Discord. Yeah, it's been fun. It has been. Uh, I've gotten to use my ecology knowledge to to sort of help those discussions. Anything I can use ecology knowledge on, though, it's it's okay in my book. Yeah, and I mean, hey, what a surprise. Things flow a little bit better when they make a little bit more sense. This season, we've talked a lot about um, cause and effect uh, and and how when you make something in the world, you have to give it a reason for being there and what effects does that have for the future of this world. Um, And even when you're creating little things like a Zodiac that is more flavor, really, than how the world works, it's kind of nice to think about how those things flow together, as it were. Yeah, because, I mean, we see astrology's effect on our culture all the time you know even whether or not you believe in astrology you'll see people talking about what their sign is looking up their horoscope using the iconography on clothing accessories etc so it does have an impact on on the culture and so what let's see we've managed to world build six out of the other 12 so far yeah i mean 
let's let's be perfectly honest. I am a human being. Sometimes I'm very on topic. Sometimes I'm very off topic. And sometimes I make things without ever making them all of the way, only to come back and finish them later. Um, spoiler warning, all 12 of them are not finished inside my head at this point in time. Uh, well, and I don't think they have to be until you need to use them. Exactly. Because, I mean, the fact that they exist as a concept and I know roughly the outline I want to go with, it's going to be okay. Until I get to that point in a year in the campaign setting where I need to know what exact month it is and how it would influence a person born in that month. But, I mean, let's be fair. You may find it inconsiderable or at the very least a bit unlikely that the relative positions of the planets and the stars may have a special deep significance or meaning that exclusively applies to only you. Sorry. I, I can't think about horoscopes without thinking of Weird Al's horoscope for today. If you haven't listened to it, listen to it. It's hilarious. Whether you believe in horoscopes or not, it's perfect. Uh, didn't want to do straight up canon zodiacs as we know them because, let's be fair, here on Earth we have two. Or at least in, in Western countries, we have two that we typically pay attention to, which is the Western zodiac and the Chinese zodiac. There might be other ones, but I don't know them, and not many people in America probably do. I've never heard of mention of more than... <laughs> yeah, me either. And I tend to keep to my ears to the ground for a lot of things because you never know where an inspiration is going to strike you. I just did not want to be exclusionary in case one existed that I had never heard of. If you're out there somewhere in the world, like, you know, Lithuania or something listening to this... And you know of a zodiac system that is not the Aries, Virgo, blah, 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 or rat, bat, cat, tiger. Not that the bat exists in a zodiac. We should fix that. Do we have room for a bat? Probably. Oh, there's room for a bat. I also have a coworker from Lithuania, so I could ask her. But yeah, um, as far as we as people know, basically two zodiacs, and I didn't want to just copy paste something and give it the little sprinkle of extra spice to try and make it my own because that's not what i've done through any of this is give it the sprinkle of making it my own i wanted to make something that was like yes i am proud of this this is me there may be some similarities granted it's going to happen i am not the most creative person on the planet <laughs> also there is nothing new under the sun yeah but what about inside the sun i mean We'd have to go there to find out, and it's really hot. Just a bit. Although we are heading into a cooler period. Mm. Solar minimum. Yeah, but not for long. <laughs> well, yeah, but... Anyway, our sun does not affect Xanthuru's zodiac. That is very true. <laughs> I've been trying for the past ten minutes to get us to say what the zodiacs are that we have so far. Well, I mean, obviously, we have the 13th established concrete the serpent, uh, has quite a large impact on society and culture because it ties into something else that uh, we're probably going to get into a little bit on this episode that I'm sure Carrie's excited about. But after the serpent slash before you get to the serpent, because, hey, it's a cycle. It goes in circles. Watch me as I spin my finger around in a loop that you can't see. Uh, we start the year off with the ram. This may have been mentioned in passing, but here's official confirmation. First month of the year is the month of the Ram. Why is it the month of the Ram? Well, because when you spend an entire month of pretty much absolutely nothing going on whatsoever, when that ends, it tends to be kind of explosive. When everything can finally breathe again, live again, be again, grow again. You know, when life can move on after everything being stopped for so long, it's this big, dramatic, explosive kind of unspoken force. So we needed something that represented power and things rushing forward. And it's like, okay, we could go with a bull, but one, bulls have been done, but we also wanted something that could have potential ties to other things in the world. Well, I think we mentioned this in their write-up. The two different biological genders of the own have two different styles of horn. The males have very branching horns, like uh, deer, elk, so on and so forth, whereas the females curl like a ram's horn. And so automatically we have a creature that can exist in the world that has powerful, headstrong, charging momentum, something that's very audible because you're going to hear one of those things when they start to go off, slash slight bit of wordplay with horns blaring, yada, 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 because those are things I like to do. 
And it's something that something that exists in the world can connect with. This is a thing that is like me. And so we have the month of the ram, the month of strong breaking of silences, breaking of, you know, restraints, moving forward with life, being a little headstrong, you know, maybe not always thinking things through because, man, you just want to go. It's funny because you, you said that there's something that the people in the world can connect to, but there's something in people in our world that people can connect to that month in that for me, especially for anyone who lives in the, the Northeast or the, the North, um, in the spring, so, so our winter feels kind of like the, the serpent, serpent month on Xanthuru because nothing grows and it's very gray all the time. And the minute that the snow melts and you start to hear songbirds and you start to see little tiny itty bitty blossoms on little flowers, you know that's over. You know that there's no more probably snow, hopefully. Unless you're in Maine. Please, no more snow. Um, <laughs> We've had enough. I'd like to try something else. <laughs> I would like some sunshine, please. I would like to unsubscribe from this service, please. My free trial has ended and I did not enjoy. Um, <laughs> but but so, like, as soon as the, the birds come back here, I'm like, oh, it's, it's beautiful again. Hooray! Um, and so that reminds me of this, this month of the ram that happens on Xanthi Roof. So. So yeah, it's a good thing uh, We when we go forward from there. So this is something that I drew inspiration more from the, uh, the Chinese Zodiac style of doing things because there's a whole story there. And I liked that idea of the progression of the months of the year telling a story based on the way things are moving. And so obviously we start with the ram, as we mentioned. So what, what's going to come after a ram, you know? The silence has been shattered. Life is there again. What's going to follow that? You know, how do you follow that? That's a tough act to follow. How do you make yourself important in the world? Well, okay, maybe you're not going to feel that important. Maybe it's a creature that it's coming after the ram and it's like, oh boy, it was the ram's time again. Gee, everybody's so happy about the ram. (laughs) And so I decided, okay, let's go with the boar. Why do we go with the boar? Well, okay, this thing is following directly after a ram. Here's a creature that keeps its nose to the ground who, you know, might not necessarily be looking directly at the thing that it's following behind because maybe it's not perfectly happy about facing the uh, southbound end of a northbound ram. (laughs) But how can this be a positive thing? What's, What's good about keeping your nose to the ground? Well, in the case of a boar, they've got tusks. They've got these big protrusions from their face that you know obviously they need for biological reasons but how could this be something useful for a story of you know the progression of the months of the year well what happens when spring comes life starts to renew itself you know things can start considering growing again well what's going to need to happen things are going to need to be planted so here you've got this this boar coming along following the ram its nose is to the ground because it's not exactly happy about its place in the world but its tusks are plowing through the earth they're breaking up all of that dead ground you know from the previous month and they're doing something with it they're tilling the earth this is a good thing this is a positive thing you know the month of the boar here we have okay they're not the most outgoing forthcoming shine in the spotlight type of people, but they're the hard workers. They're the people who can really dig in and do what needs to be done, even if it's not the most thanked work out there. So here we go. Here's more positive aspects to, you know, something that could potentially, you know, be seen as being too down on themselves because they're not the man of the hour. You know, they're not the one that shatters the silence, but they do important work. Makes sense. It's also a nice different connotation with the boar because when boars are depicted in a lot of things that other people write in other you know settings a lot of the times they have more of the characteristics of what we've given to the ram in that they're charging forward headstrong wild pig-headed so it's nice to see you know yes the boar is also in the chinese zodiac but it has there's different aspects of the animal that you've chosen to, I, to emphasize for the sake of your story. 
Yep. And that kind of goes forward. This next one in the progression, it's, it's kind of a bit of a stretch, but it's still, it makes me happy to think about because it's more of an artistic kind of interpretation. It's folklore. You can do that. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, that's the thing is we're not talking about the actual animals you see in appearance as you go throughout the year. It's like, oh, you're going to start seeing the rams first. And uh, tomorrow we've got a 50% chance of boar. <laughs> 30 to 50 of them specifically. No, those are feral hogs. There is a difference. <laughs> you know I had to say it, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we go into the third month of the year after the, the ram has shattered the silence and the boar has tilled the earth. But those two on their own aren't enough to really get things moving again in the world. You know, obviously, in order for things to grow, there has to be something to grow. So what creature do we have next? Well, obviously, if we want things growing, you think of trees blossoming, of, you know, new growth, saplings springing up, branching off. What has branches? Well, okay, how about the elk? You've got these big branching horns. And, all right, so it follows along behind the boar, and it's a much more graceful creature, just kind of moving through these freshly plowed fields. And, well, okay, I mean, this is a thing that likes to eat plants, so... It would make perfect sense, obviously, in a folklore sense, for it to be the one scattering seeds out. It gives a shake of its head, and seeds go flying from the antlers and land into the ground, and those new growths will start forking off on their own. I mean, it also likes to fertilize. I mean, yeah, there is that, but (laughs) that's a much more crude adaptation. (laughs) Uh, Yes, uh, yours is much more poetic. Um, Mine is just, that's basically all elk do. (laughs) I'm imagining the the very ancient people who originally wrote this poem because it was probably a poem when it first appeared and they're trying to piece together the Zodiac and some really, really crass guy suggests Monica's take on it and and the tribe's poet is, how about this way instead? (laughs) I hear what you're saying. I like where you're going, but let me put a little PR spin on that. (laughs) (laughs) we can't exactly tell that to the kids although they would find it funny well yes but (laughs) but it it gives you that sense of progression through the world in here's this thing with branches itself that leads to the return of the things with branches you know the trees start blossoming the depictions of the elk in folklore probably have you know blossoms and whatnot and buds in its antlers and it's all very beautiful and nice and elegant and so you probably have this month being associated with the more calm and collected individuals who are totally fine with their places in the world they move at their own pace they do what they need to do what only they can uniquely do and go with it but obviously in order for any kind of system, even in your, when you're talking about something as artistic and folklorish and fantastical as a Zodiac system, there's got to be some level of balance, right? So what's going to follow an elk and a boar and a ram? Well, we obviously need a predator. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, let's be fair, not everything likes to eat leafy green things and truffles. I mean, if you're in New Zealand, yes, everything, there is no predators. There are no predators there. So, I mean, maybe, but Xanthuru is not New Zealand. Unfortunately not. Only one place can be New Zealand, and that's New Zealand, and we love you for it, New Zealand. But we do need a predator, don't we? Because, I mean, these three animals at the start of the year, they're working hard. They're doing what they need to do, what only they can do. But man, plowing fields, sowing seeds, getting everything ready to grow for the year, that is exhausting work. They got to take a break sometime. And man, wouldn't you know it, you go to catch some sleep or just, you know, rest under a tree. And uh, huh, that's, that's some howling right there. Oh, uh, that's not good. We should probably run. Oh, we're too tired to run. And here come the wolves. I really like that specifically from, from, because I'm such an ecology nerd. I love it because the wolf would hunt those, those first three animals. Obviously they would, they're, they're prey animals basically. Um, (laughs) So I, I enjoy predator prey interactions. I enjoy studying them, which is one of the reasons why I enjoyed the stories that are generated from the Zodiac. And so, Let's be fair. It doesn't necessarily mean the wolves are bad things. They're just doing what they do. It's been a long winter. 
here are these animals that have done their job. They're very tired and they are so very, very hungry after not only a long winter, but a season of heck everything. Well, so wolves are actually really good for their ecosystem. Speaking from speaking from an ecological perspective, because I always do, uh, wolves are really, really good for their ecosystem. And to the point where we were really happy when wolves were reestablished in Rainier National Park, I believe is where it was. They like had disappeared and we finally reintroduced them because they were able to help control populations um, and they filled a niche that needed to be filled, basically. Didn't something like that happen in Yellowstone as well? Maybe it was Yellowstone I was thinking of. Because, yeah, go figure, as uh, Monica was so kind to point out, the Elks really like doing something that involves sowing seeds. (laughs) What happens if there's nothing to stop that? There's not going to be enough greenery to go around. You get what happened on Isle Royale is is what happened, because it was what would happen. It's the moose on Isle Royale, I believe. They would continuously mate and create more of them, and then... When there are too many and there aren't enough resources, that population is going to bust, basically. So yeah, here we have a a slight measure of control. Here we have a creature that brings a little balance to this world of new growth and everything springing back up and out in some cases. Uh, You know, something that eats these creatures and, as Monica pointed out, is good for the ecosystem that way because... I mean, obviously, we can't just have everything growing all the time. Willy-nilly, you'd get ridiculous. Wouldn't be able to see the forest for the trees. <laughs> so, yeah, here we have wolves. Obviously, they are they are patient. They know when to strike, when to take action. Obviously, you would not want to, you know, descend as a small pack of wolves on a large collection of boars. That's not going to work out in your favor. So we're going to bide our time. We're going to wait until one is isolated or tired or sleeping after they've, you know, done their hard work for the year. And that's when we feast. Don't, don't you, do you know that boars, remember those tusks that you were talking about? Taking on a whole bunch of animals with tusks all at once. Who man, that's got to that that would hurt. Don't bite the pointy end. <laughs> exactly. That's not the end they're going after. So yeah, we have the wolves coming in, cleaning up some of the uh <laughs> some of the excess prey animals, so to speak, making sure everything stays nice and neat and orderly, but um then you get kind of a unusual point in the progression. It's like, well, okay, what's going to come after a predator? Scavenger. I love the way you said that. <laughs> well, let's let's be fair. Yes, obviously there could be bigger predators, but then you're going to kind of get a snowball effect of, well, okay, what's going to eat this thing? Okay, what's going to be big enough to eat this thing? Yeah, and that's boring. Well, and the other thing too is that eventually, I mean, in our world, there aren't very many predators for wolves, period. Um, other than humans. And we don't really want to inject that much reality into this fantasy world uh i mean i don't want to put words in josh's mouth but i personally do not want to put that much reality into this fantasy world (laughs) also the other predator for wolves that would exist on xanthuru is the own and having a bunch of animals and then one own in your zodiac would be really really racist can we can we bring that pr guy back (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah it would be very very racist um (laughs) and we we like to avoid that where possible just 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 a bit but as monica pointed out there are these delightful category of creatures called scavengers so obviously a wolf kills something they're not going to devour every last morsel of it that's uh not 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 smart right their teeth are made for tearing flesh uh they're not really made for picking bones clean so obviously when the wolves are done with what they needed to get you're going to have some you know corpse left over and unfortunately while some things decaying is good for the environment you don't want too much of it yeah, exactly. You know, and, and the, the thing is that scavengers are really, really important parts of their ecosystems as well. Like, I mean, obviously every part is really important, but... It's an ecosystem after all. 
Right, exactly. If you have a lot of corpses on your hands or in your forest. And you don't have a friendly neighborhood necromancer to recruit them. Right, exactly. You you end up spreading a lot of disease. A lot, a lot, a lot, lot, lot of disease gets spread from carcasses of animals and scavengers tend to have a way inside their body to process this sort of rotting uh, material in a way that doesn't harm them and also helps get rid of that from the environment entirely. Well, not entirely, but they process it. So so it's it's a natural progression and they're very important to their their environment. So and this is this is where we really started getting into the community discussion on the Discord and how we wanted to build this going forward because I had really only planned up until the wolf. And that was based on previous powwowing with other people, essentially. Because, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I knew I wanted some kind of animal-based zodiac, and I knew I wanted the year to start with the ram and end with the serpent. That was about it. Right, and that's all you all you really needed at the time. In the season zero, you know, it didn't really come up at all. And I only really needed to slightly develop it as just a matter of fluff, of something to write, of a writing exercise, basically. And it stopped with the wolf. But then when we started doing this and we started wanting, you know, topics to talk about, things to sprinkle onto the world, get those nice croutons and bacon bits in there. All right, scavengers are cool. What kind of scavengers would live in the same areas as wolves? Well, and this is where you turned to your friendly neighborhood ecologist and said, hey, what are some bird, what are some cool bird scavengers? Okay, well, so my, my original thoughts were, well, we all know that corvids are are scavengers because that's crows like shiny things. That's really like, <laughs> but I, and I thought of a couple of others that were less well known or less used, less glamorous. Yeah, I mean, let's let's be fair. Who'd want to be born in the month of the vulture? So I thought of vulture, and I'm like, okay, vultures are kind of cool, but they are used quite a lot as scavenger, like as the quintessential scavenger animal right oh look you're lost in the desert and you're dehydrated what's circling you is it a vulture i bet it is oh i bet it is they're riding on a on a thermal left draft yes that's the word i was looking for i knew it was thermal something anyway (laughs) so i can't know everything and we don't expect you to um but so and i was like well condors are kind of cool but really corvids are are where condors don't live where wolves live that's not a thing and not to mention thanks to an extremely cheesy movie i saw when i was a kid i can't take the term condor seriously there was a less than b superhero movie that my dad showed me once when i was like seven called condor man oh no (laughs) it was even as a small child the hokiest piece of schlock i had ever seen that's yeah that's unfortunate (laughs) and to this day anytime the word condor pops up in ringing and conversation that little part of the back of my brain that never fully grew up just goes condor man well i was talking with my mother about this because because i did and and i was like i i suggested condor and she was like wait didn't we kill all of them I mean, most of them, yes. Please stop reminding me how horrible people are. Um, (laughs) And also, like, coming back to your point about condors don't live where wolves live, if you look at the progression of the Zodiac so far, it gives a very clear picture of where the tribe that originally named this Zodiac and wrote this poem and passed it down to future generations, where they would have lived, right? It gives you a picture of a continental climate probably on the cooler side there are probably forests around maybe some mountains and it's that kind of place yeah it gives you it gives you their their origin basically their 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 place in the world Um, and that's actually what good folklore does it gives you a sense of place which is it's basically that you know where they came from based on the on the stories that they come up with because i so one of my classes was studying native american folklore and we read a bunch of stories about glaciers because glaciers used to be big enough that they would have what is basically a glacial highway where they would there was a lot of people that used it 
And now those are melting, and we're not talking about how horrible people are, even though I keep coming back to that. The ancestors used to ride these babies for miles. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, a Native American culture in, say, from further south wouldn't really understand those stories because they don't have the same geographical features that were up that far north. So so these people obviously have all of these animals to observe, watch their behaviors, and then create stories about them based on those behaviors. And even taking it a step similar than that, if you're looking up at the sky and you're naming constellations and you don't know what a condor is, you're not going to look up and say, that looks like a condor. Exactly. If you're from the southern hemisphere of our planet, you have different constellations than the northern hemisphere of our planet. What are you talking about? The planet's not a sphere. How can you have hemispheres? <laughs> Dude, this thing's got a hemi. So we're talking about bird scavengers and we go back and forth between crow and raven for a while but i could tell that neither of those options were really sitting right with josh like i could kind of see him going eh, even though we were in different rooms and we were talking through text i could picture that <laughs> i was thinking like crows and ravens are really 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 overused they are one of the most strongly stereotyped creatures on the planet next to us yeah, exactly. Well, and like we see crows all the time in our everyday lives. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why they get into our stories so often. Ravens less so, but like they're ravens are used as like the the sort of um when you want crows but fancier. Yeah, fancier crows is really where I was going. So <laughs> the posh crows. Yes. Um but they're really, really, really overused. And so even when I was suggesting them, I was like, I don't really think that's right. Even I don't think that's right. I didn't create this world, and I don't feel like that's right. But you knew enough about it to knew that it didn't fit in. Yes. Which is important and beautiful, and I love it. <laughs> and as much as it sucks that this happens, if people perceive an animal to be, quote-unquote, ugly or undesirable or unlikable in some way, they're less likely to name a month after it oh yeah that's why the death month is the serpent because they associate it with death so it doesn't really make sense to have a less glamorous animal in the other 12 months of the year right we already have one month of the year that sucks <laughs> let's avoid making any of the other months suck <laughs> yeah exactly so then we got to uh got got get the brain meat stirring a little bit because we like to think with our meat. Well, there and there's more than just crows and ravens that are corvids. Yeah, as we found out, rather surprisingly. I sure didn't know this. Blue jays are corvids, you guys. You've got the crow, you've got the raven, you've got all these distinguished literary gentlemen with their little top hats and monocles. And then you've got that guy. The Steve of corvids, if you will. Hey guys, it's morning, I'm here, you want a bone? Basically, blue jays are the less goth of the family. They're the sparkle goths. <laughs> um, I did know that, that jays were corvids, because of course I did. And blue jays, see, I didn't suggest blue jays, because they're, all, they're not really scavengers. They're just annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but that brought up the delightful factoid of this is an earth. Yeah. We don't have to have just Earth animals. I mean, obviously, yes, it does make our job a little bit easier to populate a world with them, but that also gives it the opportunity to say, well, what if it's the same base kind of creature, but just, just tweaked a little? Now we're onto something. So now we're creating a new Corvid. Open up the, the character creation dialogue box, mess with some sliders, put in some, put in some hex codes. So, uh, yeah, how do we make something that is a Corvid, technically speaking, how do we make it more of a scavenger and less of a Steve? And apologies to anybody out there whose name is actually Steve. We don't actually hold anything against you. I don't know why, but between Steve and Chad and those names, they just tend to kind of get tend of a bad rap, like the Blue Jay. Yeah, but there are reasons for the Blue Jay. This is true. 
So how do we make them less irritating? Because obviously we don't want a month to be an undesirable creature. And that includes an annoying twat or annoying tweet in this case. All right. So let's let, let's bend this creature around a little bit. We have the, the, the basic the basic identity of the blue jay. We know what a blue jay looks like. Most people have seen them. Right. They look like Corvids. Yeah. So how do we make this more scavenger like? How do we put it more in line with? the other corvids, the other scavengers, you know, to take their place while not being exactly the same creature. Well, okay, first of all, we're going to darken their color scheme up. We're going to hit that desaturation a little bit. <laughs> or oversaturate, really. Make them look a little bit more like the rest of the corvids. Yeah, so saturation up, lightness down is what you're looking for. So now we have a, a, a much a much darker hued blue jay. So obviously the name blue jay doesn't really work anymore. Plus, they're not Blue Jays. Well, yes. But we still want to make sure that that little bit of connection is there. So how do we twist that? Well, obviously, now that they're much darker, they resemble something else. Why don't we call them the Night Jays? And already, I, I love them. Way more than their real-world counterparts. As you might be able to tell. So we have these very, very, very dark, almost imperceptibly different from black birds. With little flecks of white underneath their wings and their belly so that they blend in more to the night sky as they're flying. And their wing shape is probably going to be a little bit more different, because obviously if they're a scavenger, they don't want to scare off prey, because that's going to go against their nature of wanting something to be dead so that they can pick it clean. So they have a much more owl-like wing design, so that the feathers muffle the sound of their flight. This was my favorite part. I was like, if they're going to be, if they're going to be active at night, they're not going to want to make noise. Also, you should see Monica's face right now as Josh is describing this. Like, if he just got a little closer on the mic, we could have species creation ASMR going on right now. <laughs> it's, it is, basically. This is, this is my favorite part of world building. I don't know if I've mentioned that to you, but this is my favorite part. So now we've got this creature that doesn't like to make a sound as it flies. And it follows around the predators of the world. And the things like the wolves that will leave behind carcasses that they can pick clean. And it's like, well, okay, but here's another problem. They don't obviously don't want to get in the way too much because they're they're burbs. They're very, they're very small usually, and probably a quick snack for a hungry wolf if they're not careful. So how do we make sure that our dear scavengers that we want positive qualities of to make sure that the predators don't eat them? How do we how do we do? How do we do? Well, what's something else that their uh, their brethren, the crows and the ravens, are known for? Well, it's their mim mimicry of sound. Okay, so how do we make this even cooler? Well, the night jays are smart. They're clever. They're cunning. They don't just mimic sounds. They mimic very specific sounds. They fly around in the twilight hours, unseen and unheard by the prey below. And when they spot something that a wolf might like to snack on, they mimic the sounds of that animal in pain, of that animal injured. Hey, look. There's an easy kill over here. Why don't you come get it? That would be great. Yeah, if you could come get it, eat it, and then leave the rest for me, mm, I'm happy. And so now we have this system of these, these two months, these two creatures, living in harmony practically. Because obviously the night jays are smart. They know not to mess with the wolves. They know not to take the food until the wolves are done with it. But obviously they want to make sure there's enough to go around. So they learn to adapt. They learn to figure out how to make sure there's enough food to go around. And the wolves learned, hey, these things know where the food is. Let's not make them the food. It is almost like we've created this symbiotic relationship where, and a true symbiotic relationship where there's not really a downside. And symbiotic relationships are one of my favorite things in nature. It's so fascinating to read about. It is very fascinating. And it's, and it's, there are all kinds of symbiotic relationships that we, that we have in our world. Most of them are not truly symbiotic. Most of them, one of the parties benefits more than the other. And one, and sometimes it is more like a parasitic relationship where one really benefits more than the other to the detriment of the well, other. Looking at you, cordyceps. <laughs> um, but but there are very few cases where we can say it is a true symbiotic relationship where where both parties benefit completely. 
and really, technically speaking, more than both parties, everything benefits. Because as we previously established, both the predator and the scavenger are very good for their ecosystems. Exactly. So for the night jay, we have, they're obviously very cunning. They're very strategic thinkers. They can spot good opportunities a mile away. And they're also good at working in very diverse teams. You know, you have the wolf, which are more of a pack mentality. It's me and mine and F everyone else. But the night jays are the ones who are a little bit more open to working with someone different from them and might extend their hands to someone from a different group, a different background, and capitalize on their strengths as well as their own. And that's how we make a positive month from a scavenger. (laughs) I love it. It's fantastic. So how do we go forward from there? I mean, obviously, I'm sure something out there eats the scavengers. These things happen. A little more difficult to do in the Night Jays case because they have wolves for friends. Yeah, I wouldn't mess with them personally. Um... We should also stop to mention that with the fact that there are these things called the Night Jays that can't be seen or heard at night except for the cries that they make, man, that spawns some great opportunities for urban myths. It's perfect. What happens when you're walking in the woods alone at night? You can't see the moon or the stars for all the trees above you, and you start to hear your own voice crying out in pain. Creepy. (laughs) These are the kind of things that even the croutons can, you know, bring about. Yeah, I mean, there are probably a lot of people who are more maybe superstitious or more cautious who believe in not speaking once the sun goes down if they're out and about in the wilderness because of things like that that oh you don't want the jays to catch your to steal your voice okay that's creepy it opens up so many fantastic opportunities for storytelling and all because we made something to be part of another thing and that's that that's one of those things that happens that really highlights that you've made something good like that's that's the kind of chef's kiss the Yeah, and now imagine that you're an open legend game master and your party is taking a rest and you want to surprise them with a little bit of late night combat. You have one party member who's keeping watch, so you have them roll perception. They match the challenge rating of the roll and they start to hear one of their fellow party members crying out. They look over at that party member and that party member is currently snoring. But they can still hear the screams. Okay, guys. I was, did not sign up for horror stories, so... <laughs> so I think we should probably move on. <laughs> yeah, that creeps me out. I love it. It's fantastic. The night is dark and full of horrors. <laughs> yeah. So you know what's great? Is if the night jays themselves aren't the things that are being predated on in the procession, what comes next How do you cause a problem for things like birds that are protected, so to speak, by their symbiotic partner? Well, I mean, birds make nests. Birds lay eggs, most of the time, anyways. And eggs are... are Delicious. Delicious, but also really not well protected sometimes. Especially if everyone's out flocking off, getting other things killed. (laughs) What do we got in the world that can live in the same general area that might really like to have a nice egg dinner? Mustelids! Which is a fun word in and of itself. Uh, yes. Well, I don't know if all mustelids like eggs, but I know a lot of them do. I'd say most of them do. Mustelids are, as far as I know, mustelids are carnivorous, all of them, so. And eggs are delicious. So, Monica, for our listeners, what is a mustelid? A mustelid is an animal that it's, it's a, I guess it's more of a family. I think it's a family of animals. Yeah, it's a family. There we go. Cool. Um, (laughs) In our classification system, it is, it is the family that includes things that are like weasels, basically. Um, So weasels, badgers, otters, ferrets, martens, minks, wolverines, all of the weasel-like creatures that are carnivorous. It's the carnivorous noodle mammals. Yes, exactly. Hooray for carnivorous noodle animals. Although wolverines are not noodles, they're terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) The rest of them are noodles and they're cute, 
uh, I do not want to go anywhere near a Wolverine thing. Yeah, no, the, the, the Wolverine is the uncooked brick of ramen noodles that you tried biting into. I mean, uncooked ramen noodles are pretty tasty. Don't judge me. <sighs> yeah, but they're really kind of hard to bite into, and they probably stab you in the mouth a little bit in the process. I don't think I want to bite into a Wolverine. All right. Anyway, so mustelids <laughs> uh, in particular, <laughs> um, really, like, so carnivorous mammals tend to look for the easy targets, um, and especially if they're small mammals like mustelids. So easy targets in this case are the eggs of these night jays. Because, yeah, go figure. While they're off flying around, those nests are generally unprotected there might be you know a few of them left but probably distract them sneak in get yourself an egg or two have yourself a nice meal and now there's not a million night jays in the wild yeah and your mustelids eat well yeah and honestly so so if we're if we're talking specifically a kind of mustelid like one one particular type of mustelid these small carnivorous mammals would very likely be good at finding things birds nests i don't know if you knew this but birds nests tend to be really difficult to find because they're trying to hide them um birds don't want their eggs eaten but these these tiny carnivorous mammals have either got really really keen senses of smell or a very keen sense of finding things i mean unless you're the kind of bird that builds things on top of a light post on the middle of a bridge across a you know bay okay and there are birds that do just literally lay uh, lay egg on stick so like really (laughs) here egg it go stick um that is (laughs) there is actually a bird that does that that literally just oh this is kind of a nice convenient crook of a tree here's my egg no no nest literally just on the branch so <laughs> but i would assume that a clever bird like the night jay would attempt at con- and make an attempt at concealing their nests indeed and so now we have our our mustelid month monstelid <laughs> of the mink a creature that really knows how to sniff out the details and has that keen eye or the keen sense of smell or just that that knack for knowing, that way of finding. You know, if you need to get somewhere, a mink's probably not going to give you bad directions because, I mean, it's in their best interest to find what they're looking for. It must be in your best interest to find what you're looking for. Or it might be in their best interest for you to find what you're looking for. (laughs) Yeah, because, I mean, if you're all finding what you're looking for, your eggs might be left unprotected. Exactly. And obviously, you don't want to take all the eggs at once. No, that would be bad because then there'd be no more night juice and there'd be no more food. And that would suck because that would make the less accessible food accessible. So we have it. This one is probably the one that has the most potential for slightly negative connotations because it's like, man, they, they could possibly be kind of conniving, kind of thieving. But no, let's focus on those positive, those, those wayfinding aspects, that nose for detail, that head for, you know, finding stuff. Those, we'll, we'll focus on that. We don't want to outright call somebody a thief. And let's be honest, every Zodiac sign in every Zodiac system that I'm familiar with anyway, there are positive and negative aspects to every sign. You know, the Night Jay might be associated with deception because of its mimicking cries. You know, the wolf might be associated with destruction or taking a little too much. The boars might be associated with being down on themselves and maybe being a little bit more dour. There are going to be those, you know, here's your positives, here's your negatives of this sign. And so, sure, maybe the minx is that you're a little too conniving sometimes, maybe a little bit untrustworthy. Maybe you're sticking your nose where it doesn't belong. Up out of a log, like a very cute little stoat. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that stoat was so cute. We were looking at, so I was looking for gifts of minks, and I was finding gifts of literally every mustelid other than minks, including this one really adorable stoat that pops up out of a tree and puts its little paw up, and it's really cute. Yes, can I help you? <laughs> You're selling cookies. I'd love to. So that is the zodiac that we have so far. Now the question is, who comes next? 
we've had a few nominations for animals to be placed somewhere in the zodiac um we've had bears nominated foxes mountain lions slash any large cat that fits in that climate zone you know melon camp oh that was bad (laughs) i know um, we've had beavers. I wanted to nominate otters as well, but we already have one mustelid, and I feel like that's a weird thing to include a whole bunch of. Yeah, I think that probably, like, beavers maybe, but uh, but another mustelid might be a little bit odd to fit in. Yeah, because like in a region like this, where this is shaping up that these people came from, there's going to be a lot of lakes and rivers, so there would be the potential to have something aquatic included in there but everyone uses fish that's true well and like minks are actually semi-aquatic they they do like like the swim um swimmy boys (laughs) they uh so those ones are semi-aquatic and of course if if we're gonna round out the list eventually i mean obviously you will round out the list eventually um but some kind of of aquatic animal would be really nice ones that actually live in the water full time but yeah everybody uses fish fear the people of the month of the platypi oh goodness uh <laughs> i'm like i'm gonna just head out now because uh platypus <laughs> i don't i don't mess with platypi no thanks i have very strong opinions about animals apparently <laughs> <laughs> don't even get me started on koalas um <laughs> <laughs> Join the Discord to ask Monica her opinions on koalas. <laughs> At which point she'll probably just listen, link you to a Z Frank video. Uh, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so there are still more that that need to be developed, obviously, because you don't have to have all of them all at once. Yeah, we're we're halfway there. Living on a prayer. <laughs> but before we wrap up this episode. I kind of want to see if we can decide who comes next. It's a good question, isn't it? Because, I mean, is, is this the point in the year? Because we are halfway through the year at this point. Uh, we're, you know, well into summer at this point. Is it, it, At this point, do we really need to have a cut and dry procession of, well, this creature follows this creature directly because X, Y, Z reasons like we have been so far? Because the year's pretty well established at this point. You know, everything's kind of off doing its own thing. Do we want the next creature to be doing its own thing? Kind of, you know, the one off on its own. So actually, if we're looking at it, um, first of all, are the seasons on Xanthuru all roughly equivalent length, other than the, the month of the serpent, which is its own thing? Yes. So we have 12 months and four seasons. So each season would be about three months. We have six already, which means that this next month would be the first month of autumn. Right. And it would be the first, it would, it would be sort of the, the first, first animal that is associated with the second half of the year leading into the month of the serpent. Well, which culminates with the the month of the serpent, I should say. So from the, uh, from the list that we've got going on, we do have a couple of good options there Mm -hmm. because we have mentioned the possibility of a bear. And that would be a good Zodiac animal to have for this system because, as we well know at this point, we have a bear people. And that would be something that would have potentially great significance for them. Well, the other thing, too, is that while putting the own in the Zodiac is, is very racist, the, maybe these stories were, were created before the bear people that we know from the episode we had with our friend Raul. Um, maybe it was created before they gained sentience. Yes. Also, they still identify as sentient bears. Right. Yeah, they're still bears. <laughs> that is still a part of their identity. And also, there are actual bears. So that's, that's certainly an option. Uh, we had the fox nominated as well. That's a very autumnal creature when you look at it just visually speaking. So there are definitely some options there. For some reason, for me, foxes are like end of autumn creatures rather than beginning of autumn creatures. I don't know. I can't really explain to you why I have that perception. Um, Possibly because of the, the potential for fur change. 
Yeah. That's, I mean, and that's, that's just me, obviously. Foxes are a perfect option. There are also the foxes that hunt in snow as well, that they can find anything and do their little hops. For me, I see the bear either at the beginning of the fall zodiac because it is also a way to remind people summer is over, you need to start preparing. Because what do bears do in the autumn? They start foraging, they start building up their body weight, they start getting ready to go into hibernation. So for me, that puts the bear as sort of a reminder to the people of the world, hey, you need to start doing what you need to do for winter. It's time to start thinking about the harvest. It's time to start thinking about the winter. Or they go into their dens at the end of win- at the end of fall and they go there. But I kind of like the idea of this also being a little bit instructive as well. Like, for example, the elk would be the last month of spring here's your last time to plant guys. You should probably really make sure you're doing that. Yep. I do like, I I also bears for, for similar reasons, although not in a preparatory sort of manner, but like the bear going into hibernation uh, right before the end of the year, right before the serpent happens is kind of a nice poetic touch too. So, so there are a number of places where the bear could fit in. Was there another animal that you were thinking of as well? Because you did say a couple. Well, I mean, we've, we've had a couple of, you know, nominations, as we mentioned, you know, the bear, the fox. We did have the joke earlier in the episode about fitting a bat in somewhere. That's true. But I don't know where a bat would fall seasonally. Yeah, that is a little bit more difficult. Because, I mean, if we're talking about, like, you know, fruit bats, I, I don't know the, the geographic correctness of a fruit bat but if we're (laughs) heading into the fall when harvest time is that's when all the fruit's going to be ripe that's true and again as as we pointed out with the night jay we don't have to make things exactly correct right exactly um and bats are bats are really cool maybe not a not so close to another winged creature in just in my opinion just because we already had a winged creature yeah we already had a winged creature at two two months ago so it is a it, it's almost a difficult question to answer on the fly like this without that kind of sounding chamber that we had going on previously and working you know under the operations of a time constraint <laughs> well then i think we are able to leave it as to be determined since we since we've talked about the, the different options for for animals leave a comment on the page <laughs> like our social medias let us know there what animal do you think should come next yeah join our discord and have us and chat with us about it join the conversation since that's how we came up with that's how we came up with night jay and that's how we sourced out the mink i feel like it's it's a good system yeah and we like to have fun there so uh come on by and just chill with us and it kind of hammers the point we made at the very beginning world building is for everyone exactly Well, we have been talking about the Zodiac for quite a while now. It was a little bit longer than we meant to. Yeah, there was a bunch of other stuff we wanted to talk about, but I guess that means... It's okay. Uh, Yeah, it's almost like it takes up a whole year or something. Huh, strange. Um, So we may end up needing to do a part two on this episode. So it will be released a week after we release this episode. So you don't have to wait your full two weeks. You'll get uh, you'll get another one pretty soon. So uh, stay tuned. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so by shooting us an email at worldbuilders at rhinobot.net or by tweeting at us at rhinobot studios. Or you can always join our Discord and just chat with us there. We will be glad to answer fan questions on air. In fact, we do have a couple of them that we've been saving all season because we wanted to dedicate a good amount of time to them. Um, But as you know, since we record well in advance, please be advised that it may take several episodes for your question to actually appear on the show. But you can always ask us and we'll be glad to talk about them. Yeah, buddy. Thanks so much for listening. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This show is a member of the Rhinobot Studios family. For more information, including show listings, team member bios, social media links, 
and our community Discord, please visit rhinobot.net.